Professor Steve McCarty. Professor McCarty is a full-time professor for 22 years. He is adjunct professor at Osaka Jogakin University and the Japanese government international agency, JICA. Since 1998, he is the president of the World Association for Online Education. From 2015 to 2020, Professor McCarty has taught international ICT-related classes and holds a unique faculty development position at Kansai University. Professor Steve is a highly cited author on e-learning, bilingualism, language teaching, Japan, Asia, and academic life. In today's session, uh, Professor Steve will discuss about the online educational technological in respect of faculty development for language teachers from a constructivist pedagogical framework. Uh, the title of his presentation is Global Faculty Development for Online Language Education. Over to you, Professor Steve. Okay, everyone. Uh, so thank you for all the, uh, everyone that uh, made this event possible. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Okay, so uh, I'm afraid that what I have for you is a more like a course than a short uh, uh, presentation. So, but you can access this uh, slideshow at the SlideShare uh, later at your leisure and follow all the links and read all the readings. And, and then uh, I think you'll be much uh, better informed. So I can't uh, cover all the, the topics in such a short time, yeah, but, uh, but there, there will be links. And, and at the end of the last slide, then we'll, uh, we'll uh, show uh, where to find this uh, slideshow. Okay, so, well, the abstract of the presentation. So this presentation will show how global faculty development represents surprisingly specific actions to bring educators and university faculties up to global academic standards. In the current world situation, teaching online is suddenly universal and lifestyles will continue largely online. For language teachers, the presentation will consider many online educational technologies in terms of constructivist pedagogy, data processing requirements, and ease of use for students and teachers. Now, so first I will discuss the global faculty development in Japan, and you can consider how it applies to your situation. Universities are responding to globalization English has become a global academic lingua franca. Therefore, in recent years, English medium instruction programs have rapidly developed at universities where English is a foreign language. For the programs to be successful, the need for faculty development has begun to be recognized. A European group researched English medium instruction programs in much of the world they found that instructors who are non-native English users may focus on content and neglect linguistic accuracy, while students may have insufficient English proficiency. Moreover, they could not find a program with faculty development for English medium instruction at any university they investigated in the world. That was in 2013. But from 2016 to 2020, I had a position at a major university in Osaka doing just that. Horie reported in 2017 that regular university faculty members in Japan lack support for English medium instruction classes. Beyond improving their English language proficiency, they need to develop suitable pedagogical skills to facilitate multicultural classroom interactions. Until the pandemic, Japan's educational ministry was promoting English medium instruction to greatly increase foreign students in Japan by lowering the language barrier. Japan needs more international workers and companies especially want foreigners who get used to the culture and graduate from Japanese universities. But the education ministry was also trying to raise the global rankings of Japanese universities 
through their internationalization and publishing more highly cited research in English. To accomplish this, Japanese faculty and students would also have to get more involved with English medium instruction. The Kansai University Division of International Affairs, where I taught, has a curriculum for foreign exchange students. So half the time studying Japanese and half content classes taught in English. Regular Japanese students in most divisions with regular, relatively high English proficiency may also take a limited number of the classes for credit. Ikeda and Bilarga, in a Japanese language paper in 2018, frankly explained the English medium instruction curriculum and international exchanges as partly a response to global competition for higher university rankings. They connect the English medium instruction to internationalizing the faculty members, as well as cultivating students as human resources in a multicultural world. Global faculty development for English medium instruction started in 2015 with a seminar on content and language integrated learning. Then in 2016, an international education support office was opened. They conduct workshops for skills such as presenting or discussing their research in English. In addition, the office also inaugurated individual faculty consultations. They were looking for a professor with high competence in various disciplines as well as English I was invited to be the one in this unique role. Submitting reports on each session, I have the complete data. I translated documents from Japanese, such as the flyer that indicated what the university was offering faculty members. And then I compared the stated goals of the program with data on what faculty members said they actually needed. Clients were suggested to take three one-hour sessions, but the number of sessions could be more or less. Among 16 total faculty members from various departments in the first two years, the following took one or more of the types of support offered in the flyer. Of the 16, eight planned to teach regular or international classes in English. 13 wanted to make good international conference presentations, and 13 explicitly wanted to raise their English level for academic discussions. For others, it could be implicit. However, another seven requests to me were for types of support not explicitly offered in the flyer, mostly to check their written English in a syllabus, abstract, or paper. Some clients were determined to use their foreign language skills to teach in English and engage in international activities, while others were evidently responding to pressure from their departments. Some had studied abroad and their English was rusty from lack of daily use, so their fluency improved rapidly. Others were fine in everyday conversation but could not discuss their own field in academic English. I encourage them all to consider teaching and presenting in English because even if their comprehension and fluency were limited, actually doing it would provide the best practice to become ready to discuss their own field in academic English. So there were unique requests such as how to moderate a conference colloquium. Clients have brought up study abroad programs for their students, taking a sabbatical abroad, or global educational issues beyond their own specialization. So some were concerned about cultural differences and pedagogical issues in teaching international students. Some examples of writing clients brought to check were abstracts for a journal article or international conference presentation proposal, 
in one case, a paper for a prominent linguistics journal was receiving many editorial demands for elaboration, but I could help with revisions and the paper was finally published. So there is a need for improving academic papers and other writings, not just correcting the English, but making papers more publishable. If a university offered that service, there would be a great demand, but it would take a larger budget. The university administration is responding to societal forces of globalization. Measures of educational quality also affect the domestic reputation and global rankings of the university. These issues lack forums for discussion, but are on the minds of academics. University faculties have some autonomy, but the president's office urges them to offer more regular courses taught in English. Then the departments place pressure on faculty members. Individuals can resist, go along reluctantly, or emerge as heroes. In any case, it can make a difference in their career and their university's reputation. Groups in Japan tend to be insular, so reforms are needed in the institutional culture. Coordination of departments and faculty members could be furthered by incentives such as offering services that enhance faculty accomplishments. In conclusion to this part, global faculty development needs to go beyond improving foreign language proficiency. For international classes and communication, faculty members may need constructivist pedagogy and to be more expressive. Not just improving PowerPoint slides, but engaging directly with audiences and being active, not just inside the campus gates, but connecting with the global academic world. So you can read the full article at the URL below when you access the presentation slide show at SlideShare. Okay, so that uh, actually I had a previous presentation was all about this online education as an academic discipline. And you can access the whole Zoom recording on the YouTube at the URL that you can see. Uh, so I would just say that uh, online education as an academic discipline is a pan-disciplinary set of meta skills and knowledge beyond subject matter an auxiliary discipline now needed by educators worldwide. So everyone has their you know, subject matter expertise where they teach, and then online education is a new academic discipline, and it uh, serves as an auxiliary discipline to your own discipline, you know, in the same way that, uh, for example, the intercultural communication or bilingualism can serve as auxiliary disciplines to language teaching. Or when you use uh, social science research methods, you know, for your research in the humanities, you know, where language teaching exists. And then I would also like to introduce like a, a, an interview article with me in the Education India Journal in the below part and uh, this is of great interest, I think, to educators in India because the uh, questions were all from the, the Indian viewpoint. And so I can only share a couple uh, passages from the interview. So uh, one is about my overall theme that the educational community now has the global community in our purview. So hence a greater responsibility to engage in professional development, international collaboration and sharing. So the global community of scholars shares the same academic standards and ethics so that it's easy for us to network if we just overcome barriers of language, or sometimes religion or culture. And then another passage from the same article, that now that educators worldwide are forced into emergency remote teaching, 
it is no longer the duty or responsibility of someone else. Blended learning and lifelong online learning are here to stay. So it is up to each educator to develop the skills to make online education effective, whether we have the luxury of face-to-face -face classes or not. So while before that it may be something that could be uh, outsourced you know, to the IT department you know, or, or distributed, I think that uh, actually each individual educator needs, needs to take responsibility you know, for learning these uh, new te technologies. And so don't be shy about trying new technologies and uh, try to uh, you know, keep up with this uh, field of e-learning. Oh, then, uh, and then uh, regarding the emergency remote teaching, so when you are doing uh, research, especially towards writing a paper or making a presentation, so try to find the original source, you know, for the, especially the technical concepts in that field. So the original source for the concept of emergency remote teaching, you know, is in the, the article the, the below that I have listed that you can use for your research. And the pandemic pedagogy, so that, uh, so synchronous video conferencing, you know, through Zoom, like we are doing now, like or the Google Meet, you know, can be expected, you know, of the teachers, or it can be useful if all the participants can access it smoothly. And so that if you're, everyone is able to do this, then I recommend one, a video tutorial on the best practices uh, on the YouTube that you can uh, watch. However, classes need asynchronous communication channels also, so whether online or blended. So asynchronous means like not in real time, so or from between classes. So on-demand videos made by screencasting tend to be preferred by busy students. So Dr. Ramesh C. Sharma, who te teaches there in the New Delhi at the uh, Ambedkar University, and I suggest uh, Zoom casting. So where the teacher is seen at the beginning and end of the recorded video. So the teacher does not have to be seen all the time, but it's a good if the teacher is seen sometimes, at least at the beginning or end or during the interactive uh, part. And then I would like to introduce just a little about an article post-pandemic pedagogy that uh, was published at uh, New York University recently. So in a post-pandemic world, and not only will our classes be more blended, uh, but also our lifestyle. So moreover, online distance education brought the promise that learners in developing countries or in relative poverty could access sources of knowledge for upward mobility. Those who survive in a world with increasing bandwidth may be likely to thrive. So bandwidth means like the network capacity for data transmission that is available to you. Okay, so online language teaching approaches. Uh, of course, I, I can only say a little about this, but in general that I recommend to find free or low cost technologies that are relatively easy to use with a mobile phone access, low data requirements, and pedagogically constructivist. So when I say constructivist, or let me just say that, uh, that the, the, the traditionally uh, in, instructivism was a more popular in Asia, Africa, and, and many places, which was teacher-centered and uh, transmitting information mostly but now we have the internet that to transmit and students can easily access that information. So uh, teaching needs to be more constructive you know, where the, the students uh, discover for themselves, where they discuss with their, their peers and are more active in their learning. And so among the ways that uh, the teachers can use to uh, get to get uh, the students more active or to be more active themselves is uh, I recommend the e-portfolios. So just like a model has a portfolio of all uh, the pictures and everything, then a, a professional can have a portfolio of all your work or samples of your work and you know self-introduction and uh, curriculum vita, etc. 
and then the, the students can have uh, a place to to uh, record, say, all their writings, or they can see their progress, and or even student generated content has a, is a recent concept where uh, even the if the, the content generated by students and may be good enough to serve as uh, open educational resources for people around the world. And so in this case, the students have their voice and they, and they have an audience for their work, not just the teacher, and the students can have like a website for their classwork. And so the one example of an e-portfolio site is a Mahara. And then, then if students can use a video, then the, uh, especially in Japan, like a flip grid has been very you know, popular with teachers as a place for students all to upload their video presentations and also class discussions, you know, in the form of video uh, posted online. So you can check that one out also when you access this slideshow. Now, if you're not able to access a video in your institution or with your students, then I would recommend using some kind of sound technology because it uses much less a bandwidth or data transmission. And so some of the examples of the sound technology are like internet radio or a, a podcast or a audio conferences rather than video conferences and other sound technologies. And so that, and especially for, for language study, that it may only be needed, you know, just the sound uh, aspect in, uh, for most of the study. And uh, regarding podcasts, uh, I have done research in that area, but I will refer you to, to a site by uh, Parveen Sharma that you can see the link here. And he has a lot of up-to-date, like uh, tutorials about a podcast and uh, recent uh, technologies. And then I would recommend, you know, educators to use social media with international colleagues and students or use like instant messaging, uh, IM uh, apps uh, like a WhatsApp or a line is used most in Japan to, to use uh, groups uh, where students can get together with their peers and maybe discuss in their foreign language or use Facebook's, uh, Facebook groups as the platform for the class instead of a learning management system you know, to make just the class more enjoyable you know, for students. So a more and more advice is to use the web search keywords and phrases for what you need. So find your own uh, technologies, uh, be active in language teaching organizations locally and internationally, and uh, join social media educators groups or follow experts in your field or subscribe to email discussion lists uh, and uh, email magazines like uh, Nick Peachy's. And the regarding mobile language uh, learning uh, pedagogy, the criteria for choosing mobile language learning apps would include like uh, having a cross-platform for Android, iOS, tablet, and web interface, you know, accessible to all of those uh, platforms, or it fits your situation and pedagogy. And then web search phrases like best free language learning apps uh, or reviews of the, of the apps that you are considering to use. And then in an article for the Asian Journal of Distance Education, then I introduced uh, mobile assisted language learning. And uh, there were a couple charts that you may like to check out. So one is a history of e-learning and you can use that like to give dates, you know, when you bring up the uh, technologies like in a presentation or publication. And another chart was on the levels of involvement with ICT. And uh, so often we think of just using ICT, but there's quite a range of, uh, we're just using it without a deep knowledge or a developer level. And then I add another level of the study of technology is distinct from the technology itself and its use. And then the presentation also gives an example of setting up a Google Scholar citations profile, which is a more detailed in the next slide. 
And then I would also at the bottom here introduce a whole book that is uh, available free. And uh, it's, it's a book by you know, Springer, the major academic publisher. And it's available because the, the publisher said that uh, preprints you know, could be published on, on the web. And uh, the, the preprint that I made was in the exact format as the ebook. So, so you may you know, read the, the whole book uh, online. And so some of the concepts of this book are called the Implementing Mobile Language Learning Technologies in Japan. The contents include like the history of a mall in Japan, the line instant messaging student groups for foreign language practice, the socio-cultural pedagogy, you know, using uh, constructivism or social constructivism as opposed to instructivism approach. And, uh, and they also, the book includes uh, like a chapters or case studies about podcasting, iPads, a flipped classroom. And uh, my method for de defining terms in new fields, you know, such as e-learning and technology enhanced uh, language learning. Okay, so I think that I probably don't have uh, time to go so deeply into this would make another uh, complete presentation about how to uh, raise uh, the rankings of universities, but it includes uh, some of these uh, factors. So, and you can ch check out the two uh, detailed articles. So, so one gives a very detailed you know, uh, the, the tips or guidelines, so how to, how to align your university's uh, web presence with the algorithms by which your university is evaluated. So you can check that out. And then as far as how to, you know, set up an effective Google, Scho Google Scholar profile, then you can see the, the article below also. So I recommend that all career faculty members have uh, a Google Scholar profile. Okay, so I think there are, that it may be time to uh, to call for questions now. So, and I notice that this is the uh, where you can find the the, the SlideShare you know slideshow. So, uh, so slideshare.net slash Huawei W A O E, and that is where you can find this uh, slideshow to check out all the links. You know, or see my. Uh, academia edu uh, page or the the home page was in the first uh, or second slide and this is how to contact me so my user i we steve w a o e s t e v e okay so so well, thank you very much for listening to my uh, presentation. If you have any questions or comments, then go ahead. Thank you, Professor McCarty. That was indeed very interesting to hear you on this topic. Uh, faculty development programs, especially in language learning domain, have become very important, especially in this post-pandemic era, when uh, we are in need of more and more teacher training and faculty development programs, more so because uh, it is often perceived as some kind of an emergency distance learning, which I'm sure it is not and it should not be, or which is where faculty development in the right direction assumes importance. Uh, in that light, your uh, lecture enlightened us on several aspects of how we could bring up to global standards, performance of teachers, their uh, updating of their own profiles, their own techniques that they use. And it was not merely using technology with students, but it was understanding what to use, where and how. And of course, uh, you talked of English, which I believe is holds the status of a foreign language in Japan, where you have practiced for so long. English, of course, in the Indian context uh, is more of a second language. And, uh, but of course, uh, the ideas that you had about uh, faculty development hold true in case of foreign language teachers here too. So uh, I believe our participants would have taken some, some inputs from your lecture and we have a question coming up here. I'd like to read it out for you. Uh, thank you, Professor McCarty. This is from Jayavodan Singh Rautor. 
how can we move at a common global level development with varied cultural baggage brought by each individual through the taxonomy of cultural parameters at individual family societal country level all that is bringing in a bit of intercultural and faculty development well maybe you could throw some light on that uh, your voice is getting interrupted. The audio is a little disturbed, Professor Makati. Have you lost him? Have you lost connection? Yeah, it looks like he lost. We've lost the connection. He, he, he's muted. He, he's back. He's back. He's back. Yes. He is muted. Let me unmute him. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't hearing you clearly for a while, uh, so I didn't catch the the question. But there was uh, one more. One more thing that I had in uh, my presentation, if there was time, was how that we could be the heroes. Well, the audio seems to you know, be disrupted that, at this point. So, so all the things that you do, tenders, get you what you publish, and try to publish just say, anywhere, like in blogs or anything, to make it uh, a habit and document that all that you do you know, document, you know, all that you research and what you do that you may uh, the need to use later, you know, for publications or or presentations. So uh, we can be we can be heroes, and uh, so not just like a conforming to you know to, uh, global standards, you know, but to develop your own creative thinking. So I think doing a lot of writing then helps you, you know, your thinking also become more creative. Well, uh, so uh, you do you do believe in getting the the intercultural aspect firmly embedded in teacher training and faculty development, especially you know we are talking at the global level and discussing foreign language. So obviously, it is more an issue of how well the faculty integrates himself or herself into the language he or she is dealing with. So well, the question that was about uh, uh, about. Uh, embedding the cultural parameters at the individual and country levels. So uh, being an American, I, I believe, uh, Professor Pakati, you would have known uh, special instances of being in Japan, practicing in Japan, and uh, how, how have you really seen the, the policies with regard to teacher training in Japan? How have you seen this as an outsider? Uh, would you throw some light on that, please? So, well, the one thing that I was involved with the teacher education was uh, when I was teaching like a graduate school course at the National University of near Tokyo. And so these were the all Japanese or, or other uh, uh, foreign students. And uh, so in theory and uh, practice, and what I found was, so, so they, they loved, you know, learning the new technologies and they loved, you know, being able to like to interact uh, at a distance, you know, with uh, the mentors that I uh, gathered together from different countries to interact in real time with the, the students in class. And another thing that I learned was that, uh, that despite, you know, the reputation as an Asian country, the, the Japanese teachers are really uh, social constructivism, you know, as an approach to uh, to teaching. So they welcomed uh, learning how to make the, the teaching more, you know, learner centered. Does that answer your question a little? Yes, I believe it does. And uh, we are just rushing through the presentation. I'm, I'm so wanting to have had more time with you, sir. I'll just let one more question come up from uh, Professor Somali Gupta. She wants to 
put the question directly to you, Somali Gupta. Would you please? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, hello. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. McCarthy. It's a pleasure indeed listening to your, you speak, and it has been my long dream to hear you speak. My question to you, sir, is since you have taught both in the US and Japan, one being the Orient, the other the Occident, uh, what kind of difference do you see uh, beliefs, learner beliefs impacting second language acquisition? Also, uh, how do you think the teacher beliefs impact learner beliefs and uh, teaching in the classrooms? How have you seen that? How have you experienced that? Could you share that, sir? Well, yeah, maybe I could say like for the for the U.S., uh, I think that the teachers are very uh, you know uh, consisting nowadays. You know, but the the U.S. and Japan are both countries that are kind of uh, to really uh, the really on their one native language, lingual countries like most are in the world. You know, the majority of people in the world use more than one language, but, uh, but unfortunately not in some of the more prominent countries, you know, like the UK, the US, and Japan are, are, are more regressed. And so that, uh, so in Japan has, you know, is famous for being a very low level of English that the Japanese people think that, you know, maybe foreign languages or, or other people's business, you know, or that maybe they can, you know, get by without, you know, English or, or foreign languages, you know, so the learner and the learner beliefs are, are very, uh, are very negative, that we are not able to be bilingual, and, and then they idealize bilingualism too much, you know, as being like a kind of a bilingual broadcast or something like that. But that gives them an out that nobody has to say that they are bilingual. So in other words, there's a cultural factor where, where they may be afraid of like, and then another student you know, may accuse them of being like a foreigner or something like that. So that, that kind of uh, the, the cultural barrier can be very strong you know, the dissenting countries, if the, if the two countries have a bad relationship, then it's very difficult for the individual to learn the language of other countries. And so it's, uh, it's a lot easier, you know, when the countries are they're allied or have a good relationship. And it creates some more of an atmosphere, you know, where, where people, are you know welcome or help to answer your and then there's always the issues of intercultural communication so so japan is a very unique culture different from everywhere else in the world you know if it's possible to be the opposite of other cultures they are and so the, so you definitely need not only the intercultural communication skills and uh, the, what i call east-west biculturalism you know, to be partly, to have the both cultures in yourself, it really is a, is a way to, to more to embody the good communication, you know, in the two languages. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor McCarty and Somali Gupta. I hope that answers your question to your satisfaction. Or oh, you are slightly disturbed. Excuse us for that. Uh, there, I will take one more question. There is Smita who would like to ask you the question herself. Smita, would you speak to uh, uh, Professor Magati? Yeah. Um, my question, yeah, thank you so much, sir. Um, it was a wonderful session. Um, and my question is, in fact, not in relation with the uh, language, because I do not teach language. But it is a general perception during the pandemic, which uh, I was experiencing and interacting with my other friends from the conventional university and what worries me is that do you think that <clears throat> the online mode virtual or the blended mode is taking away the human touch in the teaching profession and it is leading to some kind of mental health problems to the students and teachers uh, so what would you like to reflect upon that thank you oh. 
Okay, I think that there was also a question from someone who uh, who uh, uh, submitted a question even before the uh, the webinar, and their question was: Does uh, how can teachers connect with students like uh, physiologically, you know, in the, the online mode? And then that uh, that person also the thought, or you know, what are the negative impacts on students and how teachers can handle it? So that, so you know, physiologically to connect with the students is a matter of like emotionally connect with people by having a kind of a web presence or or a, a presence in the classroom. You know, so where students feel like connected to you, so where you show care for the students and to give them like an individual attention and using their names and everything. And then there do not need to be you know, negative you know, impacts on, on students from this uh, technology itself. You know, so it, it's not automatic that there would be negative uh, you know, impacts or, or mental health you know, problems on the part of students. So it's often that there may be that the problems that students have like uh, outside of class that may be beyond the control of the teachers, you know, the where problems may arise, you know, but our teachers can only do our best. And I think that and uh, so for that the better and it's a, a challenge. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Professor McCarty. That was, that was so nice listening to so many aspects. Uh, we learned so much about Japan. And uh, faculty development, uh, as I said, was one of the prime areas of focus for this particular webinar. We are looking at teacher training and faculty development, especially in the post-pandemic times. And thank you so much for your inputs. Uh, we've had many more questions, but I'm sorry we are rushing for time, and I would like to invite our next speaker, panelist for today. Uh, thank you, Steve. That was... Dr. Pandita, uh, just, uh, I have a yes. one. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Makati, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation, and it was very interactive. We all enjoyed, and we learned so much from your experiences, and we look forward to your uh, collaboration with us in future. Thank you very much.